So my dear friends, once again, a very heartfelt welcome to you. So delighted, delighted to be back in the company of loved ones. And just to uh, let you know something you have heard again and again, because so many of you have been taking these classes for a long time, that uh, these classes have been continuing ever since 1992. So for a very long time. And as I always jokingly say, but I really mean it seriously, the entire purpose of having class after class after class after class, you know, ever since 1992 is an excuse to build spiritual community. So those words are very important. Spiritual community. Do you have a spiritual community? For me, uh, I felt the great need for it after my parents both tragically passed away in 1990. I felt the need for uh, spiritual community. So long story short, I was able, to, uh, by grace of God, to be able to create spiritual community. And spiritual community has been probably the greatest blessing in my life. Uh, it has given me learning, growth and maturing, becoming more evolved into the fullness of my being because of spiritual companionship. It has given me friendship, so a lot of joy in life. It has become like a second family to me. It has, it has helped me gain a source of livelihood. It has become my career. So I wish for all of you and to impress on you that the need for each one of us to have spiritual companions in our life. Okay, uh, having said that, uh, I, I want to just focus a little bit on uh, my bias about mystical sacred poetry. You know, I've studied the Quran and also some other holy books, uh, the Christian scriptures, but mostly the Quran. And of course, I, I studied the Buddhist and Hindu scriptures. They're huge as much as I could. And what I like best is the succinct insights or poetry of sages that seems to summarize everything. And that makes things very abundantly clear to me. Like Rumi says, it splashes in my heart. It really splashes in me. And I really get it. Like, you know, Hafiz, he says that all religions are like huge lumbering ships. And he says, thank God they're lifeboats on the ship. And he says, what are the lifeboats? Lifeboats are those, those insights of sages and mystical poets. And he ends his poetry by saying, every sane person I know has jumped overboard. So, so for example, you know, um, uh, we hear so much, much about God. You know, is there God? Is there no God? I, I just love that wonderful Christian haiku where the person tells the tree, the almond tree, oh, sister almond tree, tell me of God. Oh, sister almond tree, tell me of God. And the almond tree blossomed. And that for me, it splashes in my heart. I don't have to go much further about listening to too much of preaching about God. About this need for becoming a pure human being. Why does purity, why does, why does it matter that I become pure, more cleansed? Well, I just love this metaphor, uh, Jamal, if your key is crooked, if your key is crooked, it will not open the door. Simple as that. This is the nature of purity. If your key is crooked, it will not fit the lock to open the door. And that's enough for me. I finally get it.
about the need of doing this inconvenient inner work and how difficult it is and how we, we go astray. I love that uh, poetry by Mirza Ghalib who says, Jamal, this is the biggest problem you've had in your life. This is the biggest problem you've had. Your face was unclean. Your face was unclean, but you were obsessed with cleaning and cleaning and cleaning the mirror. Jamal, your face was unclean, but you were obsessed with cleaning and cleaning the mirror. Okay, I could go on and on, but maybe just one or two more. You know, this longing we have, this longing, this longing to get close to God. What is this longing about? How do I articulate that in words? I love the poetry of Rumi who says, there is a kiss we want. There is a kiss we want all our lives. A touch of spirit on the body. There is a kiss we want all our lives. A touch of spirit on the body. And maybe the last one, you know, I, I study religion. That's my, it's my profession, but also my hobby, studying different theologies. Oh my God, it gets pretty confusing. Do this, don't do this, et cetera, et cetera. So I love the uh, poetry, uh, you know, when I get confused, when Rumi says, all the theologies of the world, all the theologies of the world are as nothing compared to one whisper of the beloved. All the theologies of the world are as nothing compared to one whisper of the beloved. And Rumi explains, again, another sentence I like. He says, this happens when you move from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart. When you move from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart. It's a long journey. Okay, just be with that for a few moments. You know, there's also a danger in giving, in saying too much about poetry or spiritual insights. You know, in fact, sages from all traditions have said too much of it can cause spiritual indigestion. So little by little, let's not overdo it. Okay, maybe I'll start by, uh, telling you my fascination with Rumi. You know, my parents were diplomats, and when I was very young, my parents uh, were posted to Iran and to Turkey when I was very young, and those were my formative years. And Iran and Turkey are two places where Rumi is studied with great devotion. So that's what, that, you know, so I remember even as a little child, when I used to visit homes, and sometimes stay with friends, uh, the, the father or the parents, they would have the Quran on the, the highest shelf and they would have the Masnavi, that's the book of Rumi poetry, underneath their pillow that they slept on. And I could feel the sweetness and the love they had for the Quran, but also for the poetry of Rumi. It was like a second Quran. They would sleep with it. And that really, I remember, it always touched my heart. So even as a young child, I became aware of the story of Rumi. He traveled a lot. His father, whose name was Bahauddin, was also a mystic and a poet and a great teacher. And they were settled in a part of the Persian empire called Balkh in Afghanistan. And for some reason, we don't know exactly why, some say because the father had an inkling that the Mongols would invade, and they did. Or he had some dispute with the Sultan there. The father took his entire family and his disciples on a long journey to find another resting place, which took them years, 
many years journey, a caravan of Rumi's father, family, and disciples traveling, you know, uh, to places in Iran, Nishapur, to uh, uh, Mecca, to Baghdad, to Damascus. They did the Hajj. On the way, they met, they met this wonderful teacher. You'll remember, uh, we, in the previous class was about Conference of the Birds, Atar, who is considered, who is considered a very remarkable Sufi teacher. And before Rumi, all Sufis would study exclusively the books of Atar. And when Rumi's father and Rumi met Atar in Neshapur in Iran, Atar made this remark when he saw Rumi, who was just 18 years old, walking with his father, Atar told his confidant, well, look, here is, referring to Rumi, here's an ocean walking, walking with a river. So Atar had, deter had realized how, how the greatness of, of Rumi, even when he was a child. Well, they finally settled in a place called Karmana, if I remember the name of the place, seven years. And there Rumi's mother passed away, his brother passed away. And then they finally in 1228, I'm talking about the 13th century, the Sultan of Konya invited Rumi's father, who was a well-known teacher, to be a teacher in the madrasa he established, or the university you might say established in Konya. That's where Rumi is buried. That was in 1228. In 1231, the father died. At a very young age, Rumi succeeded his father as a professor. And he was a remarkable professor. Now, a year after Rumi's father died, some say out of nowhere, because in those days communication was difficult, a teacher appeared to really open Rumi up to the mystical sciences and also to open his heart. His name was Burhanuddin, who was a disciple of Rumi's father, who just arrived and spent nine long years. We don't know exactly what he taught, but Rumi learned from Burhanuddin for nine long years about mysticism, about mystical sciences. And then of course, many Muslims remember this date in the year 1244, Rumi met his other great teacher, Shams et Tabriz. And who was Shams et Tabriz? He was, you might say, a, a hippie Darvish. Darvish is one who is on the threshold of two worlds. That's the meaning of Darvish, on the threshold of two worlds, visible world and invisible world, who really had access to divine secrets. And we know from all the ages that anybody who has access to divine secrets, they just cannot hold it. You have to share it. It's too much. It's like holding hot coal in the palms of your hand. And for years, Shams et Tabriz had prayed to God, is there somebody I can share these divine secrets with? No answer. But finally, one day, an answer came. And the year was 1244, when Shams et Tabriz was praying, and a voice came and said, there is one. His name is Muhammad Jalaluddin, because that's his real name. Go in this direction. And now there are two versions of this encounter. One version is that Rumi was, by this time, a very famous professor. He had thousands of followers. In this particular case, he had hundreds of followers in the courtyard where there was a fountain, a garden, and he was going over some very valuable manuscripts. And Shams et Tabriz, this bearded hippie person, he leapt over the wall or he climbed the wall and he sprang into the presence of Rumi, who was going over the manuscripts, and he said loudly, what is all this reading, 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 reading? And everybody was so shocked. 
someone talking to this great master in this fashion? And Rumi looked up sarcastically to Shandri Tabriz and said, you won't understand. Meaning you hippie, crazy guy, what would you know? And what does Shandri Tabriz do? As some of you know, he takes those papers and he dumps it in the fountain, in the water. And they're all aghast. Those are very valuable documents. And uh, Rumi runs after and Shams Tabi says, stop. And he begins to take out the papers. And each paper he takes out becomes bone dry. And Rumi says, what is this? And Shams Tabi replies, you won't understand. And that starts a fantastic relationship between teacher and student and between friend and friend. That's one version. And that one version you might say is about Shams helping Rumi over the next few years to move from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart to realize, yes, there is traffic and trade Yes, there is traffic and trade in those invisible realms. But the other encounter is that uh, Rumi was riding a donkey and followed by his hundreds of followers. And suddenly Shamjit Tabriz accosted him, got hold of this bridle and the rein and said, hey Rumi, who was greater? Tell me, you're such a great master, who was greater? Was it that sage Bistami? who said, glory be to me, how great is my majesty, because he discovered divinity within him. And he exclaimed, glory be to me, how great is my majesty. Or was Muhammad greater, who said, oh God, before Muhammad died, he said, oh God, I have not known you as I should have. Who was greater? The one who exclaimed, who was able to connect with divinity within and exclaim, glory be to me, how great is my majesty. Or was Muhammad greater who said, oh God, I have not known you as I should have. And Rumi gave a very wonderful reply. He said, you know, Bistami had one gulp, had one gulp of the divine and he became intoxicated and overwhelmed. Muhammad had one gulp of the divine, but he wanted more and more and more and more. And that's why he exclaimed, oh God, I have not known you as I should have. And the two versions, one version is that Rumi fainted, fainted, lost consciousness because of the depth of this question. The other version is that Shams et Tabriz fainted by the answer given by Rumi, we don't know. But the question here is, for us, what is a spiritual, compelling spiritual question at this stage of your life? And we'll, you know, we'll do a little bit of writing exercise. Say for me, for example, you know, I'm in, I'm in my 70s, uh, for me, for some reason, after I pass the threshold of 70, uh, the topic of death fascinates me. When I was 69, it didn't bother me at all. You know, I was interested, but <laughs> I was not that focused on it. But uh, as I've become 71, 70, you know, uh, as I'm getting deeper into the 70s, suddenly it's, it's become fascinating. What is this? So, so what is it for you? What is one special question that feels compelling for you? Okay. The next thing I want to tell you is Shamja Tabriz was a great teacher. Uh, and I, I'll move on. He was, people became jealous and et cetera, et cetera. Finally, he disappeared. And then they think he was murdered. And Shams et Tabriz was so heartbroken because his teacher, Shams et Tabriz, had disappeared that he just could find no solace, no comfort. And one day, while he was hanging on to a pillar, he heard the sound of a goldsmith. Ding, ding. And, and with the sound, he began to whirl. And as he began to whirl, 
he began to find that his discomfort, his unease, his pain, his anguish began, began to lift and he began to experience a spiritual radiance. And from that has started, I'm saying in a very brief way, the order of the whirling dervishes, which is actually a prayer, which is a fantastic, they say one of the longest abiding spiritual movements all over the world, the order of the whirling dervishes. They whirl. And so the person who was the goldsmith, Salahuddin, became his spiritual companion. When Salahuddin died, again, Rumi felt the need for another spiritual companion. He founded another person named Hosam. You see, I'm, I'm not focusing on the need for a spiritual companion. It was Hosam who told Rumi as they were walking through a garden once that uh, Rumi, you know, all Sufis, when they study Sufism, they all look to the works of Atar. Why don't you write something that other Sufis can learn from? They say immediately there was a, something like a implement of a pencil in, on, on his ear. He took it down, took a piece of paper and he, and, he, and, he, and he wrote on it. And the first word he wrote was, listen to the, to the read and the story it tells, how, it's, how it sings of the pain of separation. Then they say he wrote no more and he would just go into a trance and utter and his scribes would just write them down. And sometimes for a year, he was quiet. But the collection of that has become Rumi poetry. So now, my question to you is, second question, do you have a spiritual companion or a beloved spiritual teacher? See, in those days, it was more possible to have a spiritual teacher but even just spiritual companion. And, and Rumi says, be, be aware of teachers who are, who are fiery and aggressive, avoid them. And he has a verse, he says, they're like all fireworks and no light. All fireworks and no light, all husk and no kernel. And number two, he says, go for some teachers who are humble. They are hidden teachers. And I'll ex explain that more, but uh, in, in, the in the next class. But listen to the words of a very famous Sufi master, Ibn Khafi, who says, uh, this is a description of a spiritual companion. Choose someone, the sight of whom reminds you of God. Choose someone, the sight of whom reminds you of God. The awe of whom, the awe, A-W-E, the awe of whom moves your heart. The sight of whom reminds you of God, the awe of whom moves your heart and is someone who counsels you and is someone who counsels you, advises you, not with the tongue of words, but with the tongue of deeds. Someone who counsels you, not with the tongue of words, but with the tongue of deeds. And the last advice uh, Rumi gives is, and he's got a poetry, he says, he warns us, he says, don't become too teacher dependent. Don't forget your inner teacher. And he has a poetry, if I remember, he says, um, he quotes Jesus, he says, Jesus of your spirit is within you. Jesus of your spirit is within you. Ask for his help. He is a great helper.
You know, my friends, I thought I was going to I would have time to talk about Hafiz and Rabia. I think I'm going to change course. I'll be flexible here. I think I'll stick with uh, just with Rumi for today. Uh, but here's a here's a, another insight, a Sufi insight I love very much. I think most of you know it by heart. Blessed are the flexible. Blessed are the flexible, for they will never be bent out of shape. So I'll be flexible today. And just tell you one more story because I want you to do a little bit of a written, of a written exercise, a writing exercise. Uh, around the same time a story came up, uh, you know, a teaching story. Around the same time that there was also this great need uh, for really connecting with teachers, some of whom are hidden. You can't, you can't they're not loud. They're not famous, but they exist. And they're the real teachers. The story is, uh, they say it's a true story, I don't know, uh, of two very famous teachers, sheikhs, very learned people, who agreed to visit a very remote village. And the villagers were so excited that these two great teachers, these two great sheikhs would visit their mosque. So they watched the sheikh very carefully, every move of the sheikh. And the, the two teachers came and then they joined the villagers for prayers in, inside the mosque. And they watched those sheikhs, what did they do? How did they open their shoes? They were surprised because one teacher, he left his, he left his shoes outside the mosque. And the other teacher too, took the shoes inside with him as he prayed inside the mosque. When the prayer was finished, all the villagers asked, what's the meaning of this? And the first teacher said, you know, I kept the shoes outside because if somebody came and wanted to steal my shoes, but chose not to steal the shoes because these are the shoes of a great sheikh, he would gain merit in heaven. He'd be saved from committing a sin. And the other person said, I took the shoes inside so that nobody would have the opportunity to steal. And I would save everybody from sinning. So they said, who is the greater sheikh? Which, was, who is the, which one is the greater sheikh among them? So they went to even greater sheikh and said, who is the greater one with the meaning of this shoes outside, inside? And uh, the great sage, you know, went into a trance and said, you know, neither one of them actually. You see, while you were all ogling these sheikhs and watching every move and they were involved in the calculation of saving and gracing, you did not notice that there was a poor shoeless person who walked inside the mosque. And he was a pure human being, pure of heart, it is his prayers that were the most powerful. He is the hidden teacher. So the, this refers to a verse in the Quran that the, the, the true human being is one who is humble before the unseen and brings a heart that can respond. The true human being is one who is humble before the unseen and brings a heart that can respond. So my friends, how can I uh, end Rumi's teachings? So many teachings he has. But maybe one verse he says, he says, do you know what hurts the soul the most? Do you know what hurts the soul the most? To have lived, to have lived without tasting the water of one's own essence. Never becoming aware who I really am never connecting to my Christ nature, Buddha nature, Elohim nature, Allah nature, because it requires a lot of work. For Rumi, his poetry is about transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. I repeat, it's about 
transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. It's about opening up the heart so that you have an inner spaciousness. Be more inclusive. Have much more love flow into your life. Hard work. But when you do this hard work, that's when you connect to your true essence, when you go beyond your personality. Okay, just be with that for a few moments. And so do you have a piece of paper in front of you and paper and pencil? Okay, so without thinking too much, uh, I will just ask you a question and I'll ask you to move on to the next question. So the first question is, what is one spiritual question that feels compelling to you right now? And you know, just, just think about why is that question so compelling to you at this stage of your life? I just want to remind you, for those of you who've studied Buddhism with me, the one compelling question the Buddha had, which formed the motivating force for Buddhism, the question he had was, why would a mother want to give birth to a child who would grow old, become sick, and die. It doesn't make sense. And that motivated him to search. That was his question. Why would a mother want to give birth to a child who would grow old, inevitably, inevitably, inevitably grow sick, and die? What is your compelling question? Okay. Just half a, half a minute. Okay, second question. Who is your most beloved spiritual teacher or spiritual companion? Because these days, that concept of teacher-student is changing into spiritual companionship. Who is your most beloved spiritual teacher or spiritual companion? Could be living or dead. So, so for example, if you ask me, who is my most spiritual teacher? I would say my parents, father and mother, and also Rumi, who has passed away. I've learned a lot from Rumi, the greatest spiritual teacher. Who is it for you? Give it some thought. Living or deceased? And to this, I want to add this question. Do you have at this stage of your life a spiritual companion or companions? Do you have? Like Rumi had, besides Shams Tabriz, he had Salahuddin, Hussam. Do you have a spiritual companion or companions?
Okay, I'll, I'll avoid some of the other questions for next time, but one last question. What or who evokes the deepest love in you? Who do you love the most? Simple question. Who do you love the most? But let me tell you a story, a true story of Ramakrishna, who is one of the greatest uh, rural saints, 19th, 20th century, 19th century. Ramakrishna had this disciple who was a farmer and Ramakrishna asked him, who do you love the most? He said, you know, I have a wife. I just, I love her very, very much. He said, but the most, he said, well, yes, but I also have a, 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 a son and I love him very much. But really, if you ask me the most, I, I love my grandchild the most. Then, then Ramakrishna, who, know, who had intuition said, you can be very honest with me. Uh, my question was, who do you love the most, most, most? And then very shyly, blushingly, the, the farmer said, you know, uh, Swami Ramakrishna, you know, I have a cow. And the truth is, I love my cow the most. I, I have, I don't know, I can't, I can't tell you why, but my greatest feeling of love is for my cow. And uh, Ramakrishna said, that's absolutely fine. So I tell you what, go in the room. And I'm so happy you've told me that you'll, you love your cow the most. You just meditate on the cow. And then when you finish, come down and join us for, uh, they were having dinner or lunch, I forget what it was, daytime or nighttime. And then for a long time, he wouldn't come. And then uh, Ramakrishna went there and he kind of took him out of his trance and said, you know, it's been hours you've been meditating. When did you come? He said, you know, I, uh, I've been busy trying to, get my cow through the doorway my my cow has been trying to visit me and he was he was not able to go to the narrow doorway i've been busy trying to push push him in but i have been having a lot of difficulty his body is not being able to pass through the gateway and so ramakrishna said okay that's very beautiful come and join us for dinner so the point here is be absolutely honest this is just for you who is it you love the most And by the way, you can also say, what is it I love the most? A couple who are very successful in their work. I mean, uh, Cynthia and Will, they're very open about it. They say they have the most beautiful marriage, the most extraordinary man, woman, husband, wife relationship. But they say for both of them, even more than the love of each other is the love of their work gender reconciliation work. It could be love of your work. Who do you love the most? What do you love the most? Ask yourself. 